Ever wondered what the oldest civilization in the Americas is? How far back do you have to go to find the most ancient cities in the Americas? While most people know about the earliest cities in Eurasia, not many people realize that there are very ancient civilizations in the New World, contemporary with some of the most ancient civilizations in the Old World. Let's turn back the clock as far as we can go, almost 5,000 years. We're heading to the Peruvian coast, an unassuming and forgotten cradle of civilization. Although the Peruvian coast is much more famous for the empires that spanned it, like the Wari, the Chimu, and the Inca, it's also where we find the first civilizations in the Americas. These civilizations were not just a short-lived aberration, but laid important cultural and political foundations that would last throughout pre-Columbian history. The Andean coast in Peru might be one of the last places you'd expect to find a cradle of civilization. The coast itself is a barren desert where hardly any rain falls. The region is prone to volcanoes, earthquakes, and very destructive El Nino storms. This desert quickly gives way to the Andes themselves, which rise to sheer and dizzying altitudes. It may look like a rough place at first glance, but a closer look at the map reveals something important. The Andes are the source of several rivers that cut through the desert down to the Pacific coast. Like the Nile in Egypt, these provide sources of water for irrigation and agriculture. On top of this, the waters off the Peruvian coast are some of the richest in the world and are teeming with fish and aquatic life. It is this paradoxical geography that will set the stage for the first American civilizations. The earliest people in the Andes were semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers who had learned to take advantage of these different environments. They could follow the camelids they hunted into the highlands in the summer and then retreat to the lowlands when the winter arrived. By the way, a camelid is a catch-all term for llamas, alpacas, vicuñas, and guanacos. Along the coast, these hunter-gatherers could fish and forage in the mangrove swamps that formed at the mouth of the various rivers. This lifestyle began to change in about 6000 BCE when Andean peoples in the highlands began to herd and raise camelids, giving them a source of meat and wool. 2,000 years later, people in the valleys were beginning to grow peppers, lacuma, and gourds. Other crops such as squash, avocados, peanuts, cotton, and corn would eventually be cultivated as well. All these specialized occupations allowed a diverse economy to slowly develop with different regions trading crops, marine products, and camelids as needed. Woven textiles that would later become such a fixture in Andean cultures began to appear in burials. In the 4th millennium BCE, we see the first ceremonial mound constructions by small communities, such as this one at Huaca Prieta. By about 3000 BCE, the Andean coastal valleys were dotted by small farming communities and fishing villages throughout their northern and southern coasts. Even in the highlands, sites such as La Gogada and Kotosh have their beginnings during this time. Kotosh itself contains some of the earliest religious iconography in the Americas, so it's a pretty noteworthy site. Now, there's a key feature about this period in Andean history from which we derive its name. At this time, no pottery existed on the Peruvian coast. Ceramics did exist elsewhere in the Americas, but not here, not now. It should be no surprise, then, that this period is called the Pre-Ceramic Era. You may find it odd that civilization could develop without pottery, but indeed it did. To examine this in a bit more depth, let's zoom into the Fortaleza, Padavilca, Huara, and Supe valleys in Peru's central coast. Here's where we find some of the earliest cities in the Americas. You see, in 3000 BC, something happened across these valleys that would propel them into a full-blown civilization with monumental architecture, organized religion, agriculture, and complex social hierarchies. What would emerge is the main focus of our episode the Norte Chico Civilization. Before we go further, it's important to note a few things. First of all, the Norte Chico is not the only pre-ceramic civilization in Peru, but they are the best researched and thus the best one for us to examine in detail. Second, Norte Chico is obviously not the name that these people would have called themselves or their civilization. In an ideal world, we could refer to them by the names they called themselves, but because there are no written or oral records from this time, we have had to invent a name for them. Finally, Norte Chico is not the term agreed upon by everyone. If you read English literature on the subject, it's generally referred to as Norte Chico, but if you read Spanish literature or travel to Peru to visit any of these sites, it'll be called Corral or Corral Supe Civilization. In this video, I will stick to the term Norte Chico, but just remember that you may see other terms used elsewhere. 
But why fishing? And why there and then? There are plenty of other populated valleys along the coast. Why does such cultural and social complexity explode in this tiny area and nowhere else for centuries? Well, the answer to that, which you're probably not expecting, is cotton. Really? Still scratching your head? So we associate cotton with clothing, and while yes, cotton was used for clothing, it had another important use for coastal life. Fishing nets. Until the advent of cotton, fishing nets had been made from plant bast fibers. And while these fibers work very well for fishing nets, they are extremely labor-intensive to make and maintain. Cotton is much easier to work with, and nets can be made much bigger and much faster out of cotton. Areas that could exploit farmland for cotton production could, in turn, exploit maritime resources much more intensively. Just up the Supe River at the inland site of Corral, cotton was being grown in abundance, and this was being exchanged for maritime goods from Aspero. It was a rich and productive relationship. For other areas on the coast that could not or did not cultivate cotton, archaic lifestyles persisted even as the Norte Chico culture blossomed. The Maritime Foundation hypothesis is looking pretty compelling, but does it really hold up? Eh, that's a tricky question. Further excavations in the Norte Chico area have painted a more complicated picture, and many archaeologists argue against this theory nowadays. While cotton certainly provided an avenue to a rich seafood diet, it wasn't the only crop that the people of the Norte Chico civilization were cultivating. They were growing other crops, such as squash and beans and peppers, to augment their diet. Evidence of corn has been found, but interestingly, it does not appear to have dominated the local diet. Noticeably absent as well are potatoes. Both of these are going to become staple crops of future Andean civilizations, but at this time their presence is muted, or completely absent. Irrigation ditches off of the rivers have been discovered, and these show that these crops were being cultivated on a sophisticated scale. Later, simple terraces would also appear on the hillsides. Clearly, seafood was not the only thing on the Norte Chico menu. There's also considerable debate about which communities arose first, the coastal fishing sites or the inland farming sites. Regardless of how exactly the Norte Chico were propelled, they grew quickly and ascended to new heights. Norte Chico sites show a thriving and bustling economy with access to distant goods. Spondylus shells, wood, medicinal plants, semi-precious stones, and other goods from the north coast, the highlands, and even beyond the Andes have been discovered at various sites, showing the incredible trade relations that they maintained. But perhaps the most compelling symbol of Norte Chico achievement is their urban architecture and design. To get a good glimpse of this, let's return to Corral, the most well-known city of the Norte Chico. Corral was first excavated in the 1990s by Peruvian archaeologist Ruth Shady Solis, with assistance from the Peruvian army. Thanks to years of research and tireless work, Corral has been brought to international fame, and today it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If you happen to be in Peru, you can stop by and visit because it's open to tourists. It should be noted that Corral is not the biggest nor the oldest of these sites, but it's among the best preserved and studied, and so we're going to examine it in a bit more detail. The site is very old. Carbon dating has put the initial settlement around 2800 BC, with the monuments being constructed centuries later. Excavations of the site have been very fruitful and have really helped our understanding of the Norte Chico. Corral, like other sites in the area, has several mounds and pyramids and sunken circular plazas. These plazas provided a public space for hundreds of people to engage in communal and religious ceremonies, just like an amphitheater. These features, such as raised platforms topped with temples and homes and sunken courts, are going to be mainstays in Andean architecture. We're going to be seeing them again, and when we do, remember that these sites are the earliest instance of this architecture in South America. This is not strictly a Norte Chico feature. You can also see them at other sites, such as El Paraiso and La Calgada. These mounds are massive constructions. Corral's largest pyramid, the Pyramid Mayor, covers an area the size of four football fields and rises more than four stories tall. 
these pyramids and mounds would have been topped with elite houses or temples. Keep in mind that these pyramids were built around the same time that the pharaohs commissioned their own pyramids in ancient Egypt. Even if they aren't as big as the pyramids of Egypt, they're still no less impressive. In its heyday, Corral would have awed anyone who saw it. So how did the people of Nordechiko build these structures? Unlike the pyramids of Egypt, whose construction methods remain enigmatic, we know exactly how these pyramids were built. Workers collected rocks and stone, and then carried them in reed bags called shikras. At the site, they would stack them and then create walls. Once these were done, the pyramids would have been coated in mortar and plaster. Interestingly, these shikra bags are what allow us to date the pyramids so well, because they're organic, and thus they can be carbon dated. Now, construction on this scale requires careful planning by an authority over a long period of time. Some leader or governing body had to be able to organize a huge workforce and then supervise it in the construction of these mounds, either by force, persuasion, or payment. Because of this, there must have been a complex society with a hierarchy, though no single political entity appears to have ever dominated the entire Norte Chico area. While it's certainly possible that the elite could have ruled through force, it's unlikely. None of the Norte Chico sites have any walls or defensive architecture, or any evidence of warfare at all for that matter. From what we can tell, the Norte Chico was peaceful, and it's unlikely that the people were coerced into these building programs. A much more likely system of rule would be a theocracy. Religion bound everyone together, and it could readily be used as a basis of power and authority. And while we're talking about religion, we should note that these sites weren't just towns and cities, but that they fulfilled important religious functions. Temples were the destinations for people who would make offerings to the gods. In one mound at Aspero, the Huaca de los Sacrificios, archaeologists found the remains of offerings to the gods consisting of textiles, beads, burnt seeds, and carved wood. Another mound at the site, the Huaca de los Idolos, contained small unbaked clay female figurines. Perhaps the most important discovery in the Norte Chico area, though, is the very first representation we have of a god in all of the Americas. This figure, which was found on a fragment of a gourd dating back to 2250 BCE, shows a deity holding two staffs. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you the Staff God in his first known public appearance. I hope you weren't expecting Da Vinci, but this is a big deal. To anyone familiar with the Andean pantheon, this deity is instantly recognizable. There isn't much to say about him here, except that this unique iconography is going to persist all the way to Inca times. Here he is 1,500 years later in Chavin de Huantar. And centuries later, all the way in Tiwanaku, Bolivia, he's still chugging. Now, to be fair, that date I gave you is not universally accepted. Some experts have speculated that this is a later carving on a preserved gourd, which could very well be the case. However, if the image really is as old as the gourd, it's an invaluable glimpse into the Norte Chico religion. We'll discuss the staff god in more detail in later episodes when we have much more reliable evidence for him. Although the evidence of religion in the pre-ceramic is limited, it does show us that people were practicing religious rituals that would be carried on by later Andean cultures. Now switching gears, another important discovery back at Corral that is pretty mind-blowing to me is the earliest known kipu. In case you're wondering what a kipu is, a kipu is a record-keeping device made up of a series of knotted ropes. Again, if you're familiar with Incan civilization, you already know this. Kipus could be used to record lots of information, such as dates, censuses, inventories, taxes, and so on. They were extremely versatile in recording and relaying information to those that could read them. So much so that people have even argued that they represent a full writing system. This kipu from Corral is by far the oldest kipu ever found, and it means that the Norte Chico had a way to record data and store information for later use and that this technology so often associated with the Inca is far older than anyone ever expected. As impressive as the Norte Chico sites are, they aren't alone, nor are they even the oldest. I've already mentioned the sites of Lao Galgada and El Paraiso in passing. 
El Paraiso is an important site with pyramids and sunken courts just like the Norte Chico sites to the north. It's also notable for having its pyramids and plaza in a U shape, which is something that we're going to see again in subsequent Andean civilizations. But these are not the only contemporaries. Recent excavations in the Cosma and Lumbayeque valleys to the north have revealed large ruins dating back to the pre-ceramic. Unfortunately, work on these sites is still ongoing, so we don't know as much as we would like to about these sites, and certainly not as much as we know about the Norte Chico sites, but we do know that Sachin Bajo in the Cosma Valley predates Corral by 500 years. It even has a circular sunken court, just like the other Norte Chico sites, the earliest one ever found. This is one of the cool things about this topic. New research is always changing our understanding of the pre-ceramic period. It makes you wonder what else is buried beneath the desert out there. Once there were probably many, many more sites, but a lot have been destroyed by later development and reuse. In fact, in 2013, one of the pyramids at El Paraiso was completely bulldozed by developers. Thankfully, the police were able to intervene and save the rest of the site, but it's gone forever now. Hopefully, as more research gets published and the public becomes more aware of these sites, they'll get the attention and research they deserve. Between 2000 and 1800 BCE, the pre-ceramic began to close, followed by the initial period. At this time, Peruvian civilizations began to change. Many people were moving away from the coast further inland to farm with the aid of new advances in irrigation and the invention of pottery. Pottery made it much easier for people to store and cook food and completely changed the Andean lifestyle. It allowed people to rely more on agriculture than ever before, and as a result, large populations began to move inland. Between 2000 and 1600 BCE, the great city of Corral was finally abandoned. The citizens painted their buildings black and moved out. No one is certain why the city was vacated after almost a thousand years, but famine and droughts are strong possibilities. In other areas such as the Cosma Valley, new powers arose, and with them, the first signs of warfare and conquest. Public religious imagery and sophisticated religious traditions appear at the site of Chavin de Huantar, but these are for later episodes. So many facets of future civilizations, such as monumental stone architecture, religion, urban design, record-keeping on quipus, irrigation and terracing, and timekeeping all have their roots in the pre-ceramic era. They were just as important to future Andean civilizations as ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia were to Western civilization. One thing that makes ancient Peru all the more impressive is their complete isolation from any other cradle of civilization— you see, most of these cradles have some degree of contact with each other. A good example is, again, ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. Both regions were nearby and in contact with each other, and therefore they could exchange goods, ideas, and technologies. None of that existed in Peru, though. For this reason, pre-ceramic civilizations in Peru, like the Norte Chico, are often referred to as a pristine civilization. All their advances, as far as we can tell, were wholly original. No one showed them how to build a pyramid or how to create irrigation. They figured it out themselves. During the pre-ceramic, culture and society on the Andean coast underwent profound change. Simple nomadic or semi-sedentary communities dependent on hunting and gathering gradually evolved into sedentary and urban societies. And these changes weren't temporary. They lasted and endured. The next time that you read about the Inca, the Moche, or the Chimu, think about what we've learned here, and you'll begin to notice the long shadow cast by the pre-ceramic period. I hope you've enjoyed learning about this topic, which I believe is often neglected and should be appreciated a little more. Take care, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Ancient American content.